The Cariusa County Tribal Council leads three monitoring programs in collaboration with the Nechaco White Sturgeon Recovery Initiative, or NWSRI, and Freshwater Fishery Society of BC. These programs are juvenile monitoring in the Nechaco watershed and parts of the Fraser River, which means catching juveniles in the fall after they've been released from the hatchery, spawn monitoring, which includes doing egg captures in the springtime around Vanderhoof, and the Emergency Sturgeon Live Release Boat Kit Program, where we hand out boat kits to native fishers in case they encounter a sturgeon during salmon fishing. There is also an extensive radio telemetry tracking project, which is led by Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, or FLINROAD. Each of these programs will be described in more detail within this video. So we have many First Nations that are involved with our sturgeon projects. Uh, our crews are made up of people from the different First Nations. Uh, Saikas has been heavily involved and people from Stalaco as well. And then for our boat kit project, we've had communities be a part of it from uh, Clayton Tene near Prince George to Yakuche on the south side of Stewart Lake. We have uh, a big involvement from Glasden. They have their own fisheries program as well and they have a large bycatch monitoring project there. Taka Lake First Nation has been a part of it and Nakosley has been a part of it on Stewart Lake. So many of these First Nations have been involved for years now and um, are really invested in this project. They want to help the sturgeon to survive. So the juvenile monitoring program came out of the technical working group. So CSTC has had somebody sitting on that uh, working group for many years. And part of the problem was we didn't know what was happening to the juveniles. We did get the hatchery started, but we still weren't sure uh, how well the wild juvenile were uh, surviving. And then we needed to know how the hatchery juveniles were doing. So we developed this program to go out uh, in the fall or late summer to try and catch the juveniles. So initially we tried all different methods. We used, uh, we tried bleach seine, we tried set lines, we tried angling, uh, we tried cod traps, like pretty much every kind of trapping you could think of. Uh, and finally settled on set lines, so uh, a line with hooks uh, intermittently that were baited. And we realized that sockeye was the best bait for this. So we put these set lines out uh, all over the Nechaco River and then we realized that there was a core area that they were in. So then we were focusing on the core area. And more recently, because there's a concern of how many fish may be going into the Fraser River, we've been asked to expand that project. So now we're looking at other systems. We're looking at the Stewart River, Stewart Lake, Fraser Lake, and uh, all up and down the Fraser River. So on a typical day when the crew is going out to put out lines for juveniles, there'll be between three and four people going out on the boat. They'll have about eight to ten set lines. They'll have bait prepared, all their data sheets, they'll have pit tag readers. And so they'll head out and they'll set the lines um, a certain distance apart. It could be like 500 meters between the sets. and there's about 20 hooks on each line. So they put out the lines, they anchor them, and they got buoys. And once they've set, then they soak for about 24 hours or less or just under. And they check them. So they pull them up. And every time they get a juvenile sturgeon, they put it in a, a tote with water. And they get measured for their length. They get their girth or around their belly measured. They'll weigh them. They'll scan them for a pit tag. Uh, and then if they have the radio receiver with them and if they see that there's a antenna coming out from the sturgeon then they can also read the radio tag on it. If it's a new fish they haven't encountered before then they'll give it a pit tag because every fish then has its own unique identifier. The way we place those pit tags in the fish is we use a small needle and with that needle we can insert the pit tag into the fish. In order to detect the small tag we need a pit tag reader and that's one model that I'm holding up here and it's as simple as catching the fish or when we have a fish on the boat we pass the reader over the body of the fish we press a button and it will give us the number of the pit tag that's inside the fish that allows us to identify every single individual 
that we either raised at the hatchery and released, or that we've captured in the river and tagged with a pit tag. One of the very neat things about the pit tagging process is that we can assign an individual ID to a fish. You may have seen this at Riverside Park on the release day, and then you can track your fish on the Where's My Fish page. Knowing that number is very critical so we can assign individual fish in the population apart from others. All of this information that we collect on our boats and at the hatchery, all these unique numbers come together as part of a model. We put this in and it's a mark recapture estimate. It helps us get an understanding of survival rates and actually the abundance of fish that are out there when we capture them. So during our sampling programs, we catch any number of fish. Let's say we catch 20 fish. Three or four of them will have pit tags. Maybe 10 of them don't have pit tags. So by knowing how many tags overall are in the water, we can apply that number and calculate how many fish exist overall by knowing the ratio between tagged fish and untagged fish in our catch. So the longer running program we have is the spawn monitoring and that happens in the springtime. We start with crews going out to do telemetry, so listening for radio tags on the river. Uh, they go up and down the river and we also have some stationary sites that can be downloaded and checked. So once the fish are moving up towards the spawning reach, we only have one known spawning reach in the whole area and that's near Vanderhoof. So we know that once the fish are moving up towards that area, we put out our egg mats. They're big metal squares with this uh, filter fabric on them that's coarse. So there's about 80 that get put out. And then they, the eggs will stick to the mat so they can pull them up and count them. And then also they get then transferred over to the hatchery and then the hatchery will uh, raise those wild fish and then they'll get released at a later time. And then once the spawning is done, then we know that in about two weeks time, the juveniles will hatch or the eggs will hatch. And so then we put out fike nets. They're these uh, finely meshed nets that get anchored in the river downstream from where the eggs were found on the egg mats. And then we monitor those. We do a day shift and we do a night shift. Then they tend to come out more at night. So that's usually the more successful one. And we sort through all this uh, green algae and weeds and stuff that all get collected into this cod end. It's a cylinder at the end of the trap or the end of the mesh net. And we sort it out in these glass trays. And then it's like looking for a needle in a haystack, looking for these tiny larvae. But it has been done. Our crews have successfully found several larvae over the years. The reason for getting the eggs um, into the hatchery is so that we can increase their success of hatching because the conditions in the hatchery are more uh, well monitored than in the river. One of the shortfalls in the river right now is suitable gravel for the eggs to be laid in. So when the eggs are laid in the gravel and the juveniles hatch, they can hide in amongst the gravel. But in the Nechaco River, there's a lot of sand and silt right now, and there's not that many areas with gravel. What I'm holding is a radio receiver. Uh, we use this instrument dialed into a certain frequency that we've known we've put out in the watershed. So we can look at different groups of study animals. By monitoring them on this equipment, we can see where they're moving in the watershed. And that's pretty cool when you think about it. Being able to track a fish throughout its life uh, using this equipment allows us a much more informed picture of where they're moving, when, and with that we can get at addressing why. Yeah, there's a variety of different radio tags that are available. The one we're holding here is using an adult size fish. It's quite large, and, but it has a battery life that will last up to eight years in some cases. As part of the food, social, and ceremonial fisheries, uh, First Nations go out and they fish for salmon and char, uh, white fish, generally using gill nets. And so as part of that fishery, they may encounter sturgeon. So when they're caught in the net, that's what's known as bycatch, because it's not the species of fish they were targeting. The bycatch monitoring was developed because the fishers would get their nets uh, torn or wrecked from the sturgeon rolling in them. And so we wanted to encourage fishers to report to us on any sturgeon they encountered. And we figured that a good way to do that would be to help them mend their nets. And um, so we developed these kits 
so they have a twine in them, a mesh, a knife if you need to cut any of the rope off, uh, reporting forms. There's a DVD that explains how to use the kit and the background of the whole program. So these kits have been distributed about five of them per community every year. And so there is usually a catch monitor in each community that is there for the salmon fishing. That's normally when the sturgeon are encountered. And so those people generally will also be the sturgeon by catch monitor and help the fishers to fill out the forms. So that program has been running for many years now. It's been very successful in releasing lots of sturgeon back into the lakes and rivers.